extra, extra. Get your peeps here. Only a penny a peep. In the 1890s, New York City street corners echoed with the voices of newsboys peddling for newspapers for a penny a peep. But on July 20th, 1899, those corners were silent as the newsboys took a stand and went on strike against the millionaire newspaper owners, William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. In the 1890s, there were 15,000 homeless children on the streets of New York. Many of these children were immigrants, orphans, or runaways. Most started working by age 7 and learned early to fend for themselves. The most common job was selling newspapers or papes for short, which earned the boys the titles of newsboys or newsies. It was a difficult life for the newsboys. They slept on the streets and struggled for food. Poor working conditions led to bad habits like gambling and smoking. Although they were independent, strong-willed, and competitive, they also looked out for each other when they needed to. Newsies were an army of young boys with no leader, and they had no idea how vital they were to the newspaper business. To get started, Newsies would borrow money in order to purchase papers to sell. In 1899, Newsies brought 100 papers for 50 cents and sold these papers for a penny each. They worked tirelessly to sell all these papers because they could not return unsold ones. In order to determine how many newspapers to buy, the newsboys would consider the headlines, the time of day, the weather, and big events. Lackluster headlines did not sell papers, so sometimes the boys had to embellish the stories and create their own headlines worth shouting about. With all their work, they only averaged a profit of 25 cents per day, and that was on a good day. Sometimes it cost 10 cents per night just to have a bed to sleep on. They still needed money for food and money to buy more papes the next day. There were some lodging homes set up for the newsboys in hopes to give them guidance. It was a daily struggle, as described by New York City historians Greg Young and Tom Myers. You know, by the late 19th century, there were a lot more street corners and there were a lot more people. But if you find the right street corner, is that because you were keeping your sales? Or how exactly did that work? If you were a standard newsboy, you would go down at crack of dawn. You would go down to Printing House Square. That's where all the papers were being made early in the morning. It would just have this stench of ink. Mm. There would be usually a paper you would be aligned to, but you weren't contracted to them in any way. Kind of like gangs, where like, I'm a Herald newsboy. I'm selling these newspapers, and that's my corner, and that's my turf and territory. And they would buy the papers themselves and then resell them? What they would do, for 50 cents, they would, they would go and they would get 100 newspapers. They would have to go out to the corners and they would have to sell every one of those newspapers. And they only made a profit if they sold over a certain amount. So sure. say, like, if it was 100 papers, they made a profit if they sold over 60. Now, of course, I mean, the problem with that is, of course, sometimes you didn't sell them all. And you were just stuck with them. And so, or it was no, a slow news day and people didn't care, or a holiday or something. And if there was terrible weather, no one was out buying papers. Now, this is, of course, one of the many hardships of being a newsie. Of course, like standing there in snow and wind, trying to hawk a newspaper. Throughout the 1890s, the newspaper industry boomed. The most powerful men in New York City, millionaires William Randolph Hearst, owner of the New York Journal, and Joseph Pulitzer, owner of the New York World, were at the head of yellow journalism in a constant competition to sell the most papers. Yellow journalism presented little or no legitimate news, but used eye-catching headlines, exaggerations, and sensationalism to sell their papers. Headlines included the Yellow Kid cartoons to attract customers, and these newsboys sale of these papers made Hearst and Pulitzer millions. In the summer of 1898, the United States declared war on Spain, and for three months of the war, the newsboys sold many papers from the competing New York World and New York Journal. This was the first media war as both newspapers sensationalized war events in order to boost their sales. Headlines spoke of the war, the enemy, and the treachery. But by 1899, the war had ended and there were no big headlines to report. Newsboys had a hard time selling papers with even their best tactics, and newspaper profits declined. Although Hearst and Pulitzer competed with each other, they both wanted to make more money. They considered raising the cost of the newspapers, but feared customers wouldn't buy them. They debated laying off factory workers, but feared retaliation from the men. Instead, they decided to raise the Newsies' cost from 50 cents to 60 cents per 100 papers. The difference was only 10 cents, but if that 10 cent increase meant so much to these millionaires, imagine what it meant to the newsboys. To them, it was a loss of livelihood. 
Hearst and Pulitzer did not expect the boys to take a stand against them over 10 cents. Immediately, the newsboys demanded the price to decrease or they would boycott the world and the journal, but the owners refused to change the price. On July 19, 1899, the newsboys met in City Hall Park to discuss a strike. They formed a union, elected officers, developed strategy, and sent the word to other newsboys in all parts of the city. No newsboys were to sell the journal or the world. The strike officially began on July 20, 1899, and initially there was some violence with the boys attacking news wagons, push carts, and scabs. Scabs were those boys who continued to sell despite the strike. Within a few days, the strike spread from Manhattan to Brooklyn and from Harlem to Battery Park. It even affected sales in the other states. One of the leaders of the strike was Kid Blink. He figured the best way to be taken seriously was through nonviolence. The boys held parades and outdoor rallies to band together to gain the support of their customers. One rally was held at Printing House Square at the end of the Brooklyn Bridge. Not only did it stop the news, but the rally stopped NYC altogether as thousands of boys blocked the bridge's access. During another rally, a newsboy bought 1,500 pretzels to share with the others. This one act brought all the kids together to work toward a common goal. Normally competitive, the boys realized for the strike to be successful, they had to find courage to take a stand together. The boys took up a collection and had handbills printed out to pass out to people asking for help. Kid Blink refused bribes from Pulitzer and Hearst to end the strike, and the boys said they would starve rather than put honest boys out of their job. Kid Blink encouraged the boys to stick together like plaster and win back their 10 cents through nonviolence. Kid Blink was quoted as saying, This is a time which tries the hearts of men. Just as founding father Thomas Paine said at the beginning of the American Revolution. Yet, these were young boys striking, not men and their lives were not like children. They had to work hard and suffer many hardships. The boys listened to Kid Blink and proved they were organized and in support of each other in their stand against the millionaires. As the strike wore on, the World and Journal circulation dropped to one third of its normal amount. The drop in circulation and profit sent a direct message to Pulitzer and Hearst and they were forced to take the boys seriously. The strike had such momentum that the newsboys were praised as creating the most successful strike in the history of New York City. In the beginning, public opinion of the strike was not good because people thought the boys were too violent based on reports by Hearst and Pulitzer. However, the strike was well documented by smaller newspapers that gave the public the only factual information on the newsboys' actions during the two-week strike. These newspapers also reported on the true plight of the newsboys, the long hours for little money, and their poor living conditions. Suddenly, the public's opinion changed and many adults began to support these newsboys. This infuriated Hearst and Pulitzer. The news dealer organization supported the newsboys as well. They decided to stop carrying the world or the journal altogether. This finally drove Hearst and Pulitzer to a compromise. A memo from Don Seitz to his boss Joseph Pulitzer noted that the loss in circulation had been colossal. They could not lose all their sales. First, they offered to drop the price to 55 cents per 100 papers, but the newsboys refused. Finally, on August 2nd, 1899, they reached a compromise that the price would remain at 60 cents per 100 papers, but the newsboys could now return any unsold papers for a full refund. The newsboys were very happy with the new arrangement because they would never go into debt again. Hearst and Pulitzer finally recognized that the newsboys were vital to their success. Although the newsboys strike was short-lived, many injustices were revealed. One of the champions of the newsboys was photographer Lewis Hine. His photographs of their plight and living conditions were later used to form child labor laws. The strike also helped to shape American industry, igniting other laborers to strike. The National Child Labor Committee was formed in 1904 to stop child labor in factories and on the streets of America. The newsboys proved that even children could take a stand against the seemingly untouchable bosses like Hearst and Pulitzer. They became national icons for their bravery and unity, and they empowered others to take a stand and fight for their rights in the future. The newsboys' strike of 1899 became one of its most successful protests ever made by children who were determined to change their lives for the better.